chapter 2, Word Problems chapter 2, and be certain to include today's date so that your notes are organized, okay? Word Problems chapter 2. Now we're going to be looking at three problems in your notes, okay? Three problems. So let's jump right into this. Let's look at these three problems and hopefully help you guys learn some different things that we can apply. Um, what we've learned about polynomials in this chapter and rational functions. Um, apply this to some word problems, okay? So in your books, there's no need for you to write all this down. Please don't do that. In your notes, just simply write page 141, example number 5. Page 141, example number 5, okay? Now I'm going to go pretty fast in this video. I have everything already pre-written down, okay? So I'm just going to click through pages like this and just show you different things, okay? So um, pause the video as much as you need to. Okay, but having said that, um, let me go ahead and read this problem to you while you're turning over to page 141, example 5. A baseball is hit at a point 3 feet above the ground at a velocity of 100 feet per second and at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the ground. The path of the baseball is given by this function here. So here's the function we're going to use, okay? And by the way, notice it is a quadratic function, x squared, okay? It's a second degree, or we call that a quadratic function. f of x is the height of the baseball in feet, and x is the horizontal distance from home plate in feet. So in other words, I can put in a horizontal distance and get out a height of the ball. Got it? X is the distance the ball is going this way. F of X or Y is the distance the ball is going up in the air this way. Okay. So having said that, here we go. What is the maximum height reached by the baseball? And how far does the baseball travel horizontally? So let's look at these two questions, okay? First of all, this question here. What is the maximum height reached by the baseball? Now, students, listen. The first thing you should have noticed is, is that we have a quadratic equation. Thus, we know our graph is going to be a parabola. We also notice that it's a negative A term. Remember, A is the coefficient with your x squared. Remember from algebra class, whenever it's a negative A, the parabola is going to open downward. And this, doesn't that make sense? When's the last time someone's hit a baseball and it's went like this, underground, and came back up again? When you hit a baseball, it's either going to be a line drive like this, or it's going to go up in the air and come back down. So we know we have a parabola that looks like that. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little picture of the graph. So I would encourage you, it's always good students to visualize what we're doing, especially in now, if you don't like to do that, you take notes however you want to, but my suggestion to you is to get a picture of the graph. So notice I started the bat or the ball, leaving the bat three feet off the ground, because it says that right here, the baseball is hit three feet above the ground, okay? And the baseball traveled like this and landed over here, okay? So it's always good to get a picture of what we're looking at. And I put X here for the ground. Here's the guy standing, you know, he's right here. Um, if you want to draw that, get all fancy you can. And there's the bat that he swung, hit the ball there, okay? So there's a picture of it. Now, think about this. They want to know the maximum height reached by the baseball. Well, students, the maximum height or point on this graph is what we call the vertex. Is it not? Sure it is. Now, I told you I have a lot of this written down already. You're probably going to have to pause the video a lot, but I like I like to teach this way when it's word problems. I like everything written down and mapped out, so I'm not writing so much, okay? So pause the video as much as you need to, but doesn't it make sense, students, that the height of the ball is going to be at the vertex? So students, X is not the height. X is how far over the ball was when it reached its height. Why is the height? So all that we have to do is find the vertex, and we know the height of the baseball, which is your y. Okay, that's all we have to do. So by now, we should know how to find the vertex of a parabola. I hope we do. This is algebra 1, okay? Negative b over 2a will give you the vertex of a parabola, or at least the x value. So the number with x squared is your a, and the number with your x, 1, is your b, okay? We don't need C. We're not worried about that. So I make my substitutions. B is 1, so I put a 1 in, bring over the negative sign, and then where A is, I put this right here, okay? So now I'm going to simplify this with my calculator. When you simplify it, you will get this right here. 2 times this number is negative 0.0064, negative 1 up top, okay? So negative 1 divided by negative 0.0064 will give you this out, 156.25. Now notice, that is your x value of your vertex. Students, please don't 
is what I just said. This is the x value of the vertex. That is not the height. That's how far over the ball is. The ball is over 156.25 feet when it reaches its height. We have not yet found the height like they asked us to, okay? So see this number here? It goes in for x right here. So I put it in for x. I'm over 156.25. Now how would I find y? Guys, are you serious? Piece of cake. This is your x value. So you pick that number up and you put it in for x. Put it in for x and you'll get out your y. Okay? Put it in for your x and you'll get out your y. That's true with any order, order pair. You guys know that. If I have an order pair of, if I have a value of 6 and I want to know what y is, I put 6 in for x and I get out my y. Okay? So take this and put it in for your x and you'll get out the um, height. Okay? So here we go. Everywhere there's an x, I put 156.25. Got it? Then I simplify this using my calculator. And you get 81.125. Now students, that's the height. Okay? So that's your y value. So we're over 156.25. And we're up 81.125. Alright, so I'm going to put this number here in for y right here. There we go. So, uh, my height, the, the maximum height of the baseball is 81.25. Now, moving on to the second question, how far does the baseball travel horizontally? Now students, before we go any further, do you not see how helpful this drawing was? I hope you guys will learn to do drawings for your word problems whenever you can. Now, I want to know how far the baseball traveled horizontally. So, doesn't it make sense? I'm looking for this point here. I mean, think about it. This point here tells me how far over I am, right? Sure it does. My x and my y. So, my x value for this order pair here will tell me how far over I am, okay? Now, some of you are like, Mr. Earhart, we know this x value right here is halfway over. No, it's not. That's only true if this point right here was at the origin like that and the parabola looked like that. Then this would be in the middle and you could take this value right here and double it and get this value over here. You can't do that when the parabola is up here in the air like this, okay? Because it really goes back like this. The whole parabola does, okay? So we're going to have to find this order pair here. Now, think about it. We know one of these values already. We know one of these values without any work at all. Zero work. No work. We know that y is zero because I'm on the x-axis. So how high is this point? Zero. How low is this point? Zero. It's at zero. So I know the y value is zero. Well, hold it. If I know the y value is zero, then put zero in for what? Y and get out your X. We can do that. I mean, usually you put numbers in for X, but there's nothing wrong with putting a number in for Y. Here's your Y right here. F of X is your Y. I can put a zero in for that. So where the Y is, I put a zero right here. Okay. So there we go. Now I can solve for X. Now listen, students. We're doing nothing more than what we used to do, which is finding zeros. Now, obviously, this is going to be a really hard zero to find, okay? But this is where your quadratic formula would come in, okay? I mean, use your quadratic formula. With this being your A, and 1 being your B, and C and 3 being your C. Or students, there's another way to do it. Listen to me carefully. You could type this thing into your graphing calculator and find the x-intercept over here. If you want to do that, I'll kind of walk you through it. The only thing you have to realize is, is your window is not going to be a standard window, okay? You know you want your x values to run from zero. I'm kind of estimating it from here to here is 156. Over here is, I'd, put, I'd go to 350. So you'd want your x minimum to be zero on your window and your x maximum to be uh, 350 on your maximum. And then for your y values, well, you'd want your y value to have a minimum of zero. And it goes all the way up to how high? 81. So I would put a y max 
maximum of about 85. So these are your y, these are your x, max, and min's. These are your y, max, and min's. So you can do that and use a graphing calculator to find the x value. I have no problem with that. Or you can use the quadratic formula. That will work also, okay? Now I'm not being lazy. I'm just not gonna take time in a pre-calc class to do all this in a quadratic formula, okay? Again, this is your A, this is your B, this is your C. Use the quadratic formula. If you've forgotten what it is, here it is. Negative B plus minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. For me personally, I would type this whole thing right here into my grapher. I would go to my window and I would change my X minimum to zero, my X max to 350, my Y min to zero, my Y max to 85. Hit graph and then use your calculation button to find the zero right here of this number and you should get this approximately. Okay. All right. Word problem number one done. Number two coming up. All right. Here it is. Now. Um, uh, there's no need for you to copy all this down. Just um, write in your notes. Page 180. Example number eight. I'll pause a second while you turn over there and then we will go ahead and take a look at this problem. Always feel free to work at it. I have no problem with that. But keep one eye up here to fix your mistakes in case you make any. You are designing candle making kits. Okay, so you're going to make a kit in which the person can make their own candle. Now, each kit will contain 25 cubic inches of candle wax. So by that comment there, now you know the volume of your candle. Remember, cubic measurements are volume, okay? So now you know the volume of your candle that you're going to make. You're going to have 25 cubic inches of candle wax in a mold for making a pyramid-shaped candle. So your pyramid, excuse me, your candle is going to be shaped like a pyramid. Now you want the height of the candle to be two inches less than the length of each side, okay? What should the dimensions of your candle mold be? So we want an area, excuse me, we want a volume of 25, we want, we want the height to be two inches less than the each side. So here's the picture in your book approximately, I just kind of sketched it freehand, okay? So there's the, um, the uh, somewhat of the picture you have in your book, okay, right there. Now, next, notice in your book, we have these sides here, these sides here we're going to call X, because we don't know what, the, no, it does say it's a square base. Okay, where does it say that? There it is, um, square base. So we know whatever we call this side here, we can call this side the same thing. Now we know we want the height to be um, two inches less than the length of each side. So um, the height right here, remember the height is if you're standing on top of the pyramid and you could drill a hole and drop a rope straight down to the center of the, of the pyramid, that would be the height, okay? So it's X minus two because we're calling these X. Now that should make sense so far, okay? So think about everything I've said. I just drew a picture with the ad in the book. I'm gonna call these links here X, so the height must be X minus two. Now, what should the dimensions of your candle be? Well, first of all, we have to come up with a formula using volume and all these measurements. So think about it for a second. Volume of a pyramid, in case you've forgotten this, is one third area of the base times the height. Capital B stands for area of the base, all right? That is what capital B stands for. So we're gonna take one third times the area of the base times the height, okay? All right, now for V, I can put 25 because that is the volume I'm supposed to use. So for V, I'm gonna put 25. Now my area of the base, how do you find the area of a square, students? Is it not X times, is it not side times, side times side? Sure it is, so. I take this side, x, times this side here, and there's the area of the base, x squared, and of course the height is x minus 2. So there it is all set up. Now let's go ahead and simplify it. If you take x squared times x, you will get x cubed. If you take x squared times negative 2, negative 2x two squared. Okay. Now, if you take your 1 third and multiply it through, then you will have this. 1 third times 1, 1 third, 1 times times negative 2, negative 2 thirds. So there you go. Now listen, students. What should the dimensions of your candle mold be? We're trying to solve this equation for x, okay? Well, how do you solve an equation for x? 
when it's a cubic when it's a cubic equation well you guys know what to do you get one side equal to zero so bring the 25 over and make it a negative 25 and now we're going to solve this equation okay so we're solving for x so that we will know what the lengths of the base must be so bring a 25 over make it negative now one more thing i don't like these fractions so i'm going to multiply everything by three okay multiply everything by three and now you have this okay one third times three is one two thirds times three is two 25 times three is 75. so now i've got an equation that i can solve okay everybody see that so now i'm going to solve this equation so here we go. On a test or a quiz, I would definitely let you use a grapher to help you a little bit. But I went ahead, if you want to write these down, pretend you did not have a grapher. I listed out all the possible rational zeros. Now all of these numbers have plus minus in front of them. I just chose to put plus minus out front, okay, to save time. So anyways, there's my possible rational zeros. So if you did not have a grapher, you'd have to unfortunately check every single one of these until you found a zero. How do you know you're looking for zeros, Mr. Error? Because this whole side is equal to zero. <coughs> so, um, to save you some time, or you could use a grapher, you will see that five gives you out of zero. Okay? So go ahead and make note of that. Now I know I'm going fast. You're going to have to pause the video numerous times, okay? Alright. So five gives you out of zero. So I'm left over with this was an x cubed right here. So I'm left over with 1x squared plus 7x plus 35, okay? Like this. I'm left over with this. Now, I already know one of my zeros is 5, so there's one answer to this equation. If you take this and try to solve it using a quadratic formula, there are no real zeros. There are no real zeros, none. So you get no zeros out of this. So x equals 5. That's the only zero I have. So x equals 5. So right here for x I can put a 5. For this x I can put a 5. And for this x right here I can put a 5. What's 5 minus 2? 3. So the height is 3. So if that's true then my dimensions are the following. My base is a 5 by 5. Now that x right there does not mean times. It means the word by, okay? So my base is a 5 by 5 and my height is a 3. There we go. We did it. Pretty cool problem, okay? Just applying polynomial functions. All right, moving on now to number uh, the next problem. Okay, students, once again, there's no need to copy all of this down in your notes. Just write page 192, example number 8, okay? And here we go. A utility company burns coal to generate electricity. The cost of removing a certain percent of the pollutants from the, from the smokestack emissions is typically, typically not a linear function. That is, in other words, listen to me carefully. In other words, if it costs C dollars, let me get a different color of ink. If it costs C dollars to remove 25%, it would cost more than twice as much to remove 50%. See, if it was linear, if it was a linear relationship, then C, then C would um, double if the percentage doubled. Okay? And that's not the case. So I'm just letting you know it's not usually linear. Um, Okay, students, so here we go. So, um, so it's not a linear relationship. As the percent of removed pollutants approaches 100%, the cost tends to incre increase quickly without bound, okay? Becoming prohibitive, okay? So in other words, there's a certain amount where to, to get rid of all the pollutants is going to cost you more than it's actually worth, okay? Um, the cost C in dollars of removing a certain percentage of the pollutants is given by this function. So you can give me a percentage, okay? I can put that percentage in here and here, and I can tell you the cost is going to cost me to get out those pollutants, okay? Now, first of all, they tell us to sketch the graph of the function, okay? They tell us to do that, and we're not going to do that, okay? I'm not being lazy. We've graphed. 
have so many of these things. I'm not going to worry about that. Plus, I'm pretty sure they give you a picture. I don't have my book open to that page, but I'm pretty sure they might give you a picture of that graph anyways in the book, I think. Okay, but we're going to move on. You are a member of a state legislature considering a law that would require utility companies to remove 90% of the pollutants while the current law requires only 85%. We need to know what the additional cost is going to be to the utility company to incur, to in, that the, okay, that the it, utility company will incur as a result of the new law. This is a very, very practical word problem, okay? So here we go. First of all, think about it. How in the world can I tell you how much additional cost is going to be if I don't first find out the cost um, of removing 85%? and then compare the two. There's no way I can tell the difference unless I find the actual costs, okay? So let's start off by finding the cost to remove 85% of the pollutants. So where this P is here, I put 85. Where this P is here, I put 85%, okay? And now it's just a calculator problem, correct? Sure it is. So you'll get this out right here. 100 minus 85 is 15. Notice, by the way, I did not put 0.85. You do not do that because it says P percent. So the formula is already taking into consideration that you're putting in a percent. So do not put 0.85. Just leave it 85. Okay. So um, 80,000 times this number. Enter. Divided by 15. Enter. And you will get this right here. And I should have dollar signs. That's a cost. So that's how much it's going to cost you. I'm not sure if that's per year, per day, per week, whatever. But that's the cost to remove 85% of the pollutants. Okay. Now let's solve how much it's going to cost to remove 90%. So where the P is here, we put a 90. Where the P is here, I put a 90. When you simplify, you get this. So now just simply subtract those two numbers and you'll have the difference. Okay. It cost, right now, it cost the utility company this much money to abide by the law. But if the law changes to 90%, it's going to cost them this much. So how much more will it cost them this much here? $266,667. So, students, that's it. Whenever I teach word problems, I usually teach us a decently small amount. And the homework is going to be pretty, pretty challenging, okay? And that's where you use the homework video to help you. All right. Um, I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call or email.